Greetings to all of you as you join us for the worship of First Lutheran Church in Windsor, Ontario. I'm Pastor Torgerson. We welcome you all. The Christian Church is not only talking for today, not even only for tomorrow, but we always have to see to it that the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached for the future and in future generations. So it is a pleasure for today that the preacher in our devotion will be one of the seminarians preparing for the ministry of our church, Joseph Bale. And we welcome him today and ask God's blessings on our worship together. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We begin with our epistle reading for this Sunday, which is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to drink, to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide the way of escape, that you may be able to endure it. Thus far the reading. In today's epistle reading, St. Paul is trying to rouse the Corinthians out of the complacency they've fallen into. To understand what he's talking about, it's worth considering what the church in Corinth has in common with us today. To start with, one interesting similarity is that unlike many other churches at that time, the church in Corinth had never been tried, refined, and united by persecution. The New Testament scholar Martin Franzman writes that, while the church no doubt had to endure the social pressures and animosities which any consistent opposition to the prevailing culture and, religi and religiosity evoked, it was safe from Jewish vindictiveness and from governmental coercion. The Christians of Corinth waited for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, but they were tempted more than other churches to make themselves comfortable and at home in the world while they waited. They, enjoy, they enjoyed security, and they had leisure to speculate about the implications of the gospel, since they were not called upon to affirm the gospel in action in the face of persecution. As Christians in Canada, we too face social pressures from a culture increasingly adversarial to the Christian message. But like the Corinthians, we're normally not called upon to confess our faith under direct threat to life or liberty. Because of that, 
we are subject to the same temptation they were to make ourselves comfortable and at home in the world. How did that temptation manifest for the Corinthians? We know they had moral issues, including sexual immorality and misuse of the Lord's Supper. Another major stumbling block for them, which Paul spends a lot of time addressing, was the issue of idolatry. The Corinthian church had brought an important question to Paul's attention. Is it lawful to eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols? This was a practical question for them because idols and food sacrificed to idols were everywhere in Corinth. If you went to a market in the city to buy meat, there was always a good chance that it had been sacrificed in a pagan ritual. So they wanted to know whether it's okay to eat this meat. It seems like they're looking for a simple yes or no answer here to settle the matter once and for all. You see, there had emerged in the Christian congregation at Corinth a group of people teaching a kind of radical permissiveness. They misused their freedom in the gospel to allow many immoral practices, including permitting married Christians to leave their spouses and even to visit prostitutes. These teachers of radical liberty claimed to have superior knowledge of God and greater wisdom than Paul and the other apostles. It was an intellectually appealing and intoxicating message that had a deep influence on the church. All things are lawful for me, was their catchphrase, including, of course, meat sacrificed to idols. Many in Corinth were proud of their supposed uh, intellectual superiority and having greater knowledge than their fellow Christians. We know, they said, that an idol has no real existence. Therefore, there's no danger to us if we eat meat sacrificed to them. Paul's response probably wasn't what they expected. He begins by agreeing with one of their slogans. Yes, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial, he says. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Over several chapters, Paul applies this principle in the case of meat sacrificed to idols. First, Paul affirms that idols have no existence and the gods behind them are non-gods, not to be compared at all with the one true God. However, this knowledge does not give us permission to do whatever we want when it comes to food or anything else. Although we may have superior knowledge, we must not think only of ourselves. We must also, also think how our actions, when exercising our liberty as Christians, could affect our fellow Christians who might have weak con uh, consciences or be new in the faith. Paul admonishes them. Be careful, he says, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Already in chapter 8, Paul has provided a clear answer that yes, an idol has no real existence and yes, all things are lawful for them. But nevertheless, the, th the things that they are dabbling in still pose a real danger to the weaker, more vulnerable Christians in their midst. We might expect Paul to leave it at that. But here's the problem. The Corinthians that Paul is writing to don't think of themselves as weak Christians. On the contrary, they think they are exceptionally strong and mature in their faith. Yet it is precisely because these Christians think they're so strong that they're in even more danger than their weak brethren. That's why Paul takes up the topic again in chapter 10, in order to give an urgent warning about the dangers of complacency and self-assurance. Paul begins with a quick history lesson, summarizing the experience of the Jewish people in the wilderness as recorded in Exodus. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. 
They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Paul is showing the church of Corinth how their situation is similar to that of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. He uses sacramental language, pointing out how the Israelites were together baptized into Moses, how they all ate of the same spiritual food, the manna from heaven, and all drank the same spiritual drink, referring to how God miraculously provided water from a rock, and the rock, Paul says, was Christ. Paul references the Christian sacraments to send a clear message to the Corinthians and to us. Don't you dare be complacent or self-secure. Don't think that the fact that you are baptized or that you are fed with the spiritual food and drink of Christ's true body and blood in the Holy Supper means that it is safe for you to flirt with or to play around with idolatry or any other kind of immorality. Those Israelites were also protected and miraculously fed and watered by God, and look what happened to them. Paul continues, recalling the price the Israelites paid for their presumptiveness. Now these things occurred as examples, he writes, to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages are come. Paul warns the Corinthians that in their self-confidence They are at risk of falling into real idolatry, not because of food, but because of the temptation that waits for them if they think that they can play around with things like idolatrous rituals and false gods. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. What can we learn from Paul's warning about idolatry? And what, I wonder, are we being complacent about today? Idol worship doesn't seem like such a live issue for the church today, does it? At least not in our part of the world. We're not surrounded by idolatrous statues, temples, and sacrifices in the way that the Corinthians were. And we're not expected to participate in pagan rituals simply in order to live our daily lives. But just because we're not clear, but just because we're not aware of the danger of idolatry, that doesn't mean it's not there. Martin Luther makes this clear in his explanation of the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. He says, idolatry does not consist merely of erecting an image and praying to it, but it is primarily a matter of the heart, which fixes its gaze upon other things and seeks help and consolation from creatures, saints, or devils. Luther provides examples of how we create idols for ourselves in everyday situations when we put our trust in money, property, knowledge, or prestige rather than in God. When we trust in these things, in these possessions, we turn them into false gods. I believe there's an especially insidious form of idolatry which has emerged relatively recently in its current form at least, and seems to be only getting worse. I'm referring to the idolatry of technology. Of course, people trusting in the latest invention or machine to solve all their problems is probably nothing new. But in recent years, it's becoming increasingly obvious to everyone, even in secular media, that there's something badly wrong with our relationship to to our technological devices. When I talk about technology here, of course, I'm talking mostly about the internet and social media. I could tell you a lot about how these technologies are affecting people of all ages, 
but I'm sure you already know plenty about this. So I'll just say briefly that yes, people's capacity for sustained attention has been destroyed. Many say they can't read a book from cover to cover anymore. Psychological studies suggest our ability to, emphasize, to empathize with others is severely diminished. Every year, young people report having fewer and fewer friends. The average age at which children first encounter pornographic material on the internet is 11 years old. You've heard a lot of bad news about how the internet is impacting the younger generations, and the reality is it's probably even worse than you think. These are some of the more noticeable negative effects of our current relationship with technology, but why do I call it an idol? Well, there are some interesting parallels to the idols of the Old Testament. The physical idol, the statue, wasn't supposed to literally be the false god it depicted, but it also wasn't merely a representation of it either. Rather, it was a medium by which to access that false god through prayer, sac service, or sacrifice. It was supposed to be a way to connect to that false god. In other words, it was seen as a kind of communications technology. But the main reason I say technology today has become an idol is that our relationship to it is fundamentally flipped, inverted from what it ought to be. We still talk about ourselves as users of technology, much as drug addicts might call themselves users of drugs when the reality is we are the ones being used. Much of our internet usage is structured to serve a system where we are exploited by tech companies to mine our personal data and to harvest our attention, which is fragmented and monetized in the form of views, clicks, and likes, and converted into some sort of financial value. As a result, for regular people like you and me, these technologies have ceased to be a tool that serves us, and rather we are the ones serving it and being changed by it in the process. This is being made increasingly obvious to everyone as so-called artificial intelligence becomes more advanced and widespread. Already, AI threatens to render occupations obsolete, to produce art and entertainment designed by algorithms to appeal to us, to replace human interaction, and to generate false photographs and video indistinguishable from reality. I don't think anyone asked for this, but that's what we're told to expect. The prophet Habakkuk writes in chapter two, what prophet is an idol when its maker has shaped it, a metal image, a teacher of lies? For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes worthless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake, to a silent stone, arise, can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath of life in it at all. My dear brothers and sisters, it seems to me that we are not yet satisfied with the metal idols we have created. We're trying to give them the ability to rise and speak to us, to give them life and consciousness and see what they can teach us. The Corinthians were tempted to take the easy way out and say, well, we know that an idol has no existence, so we aren't in any danger. Paul had to correct these people and inform them that although the idol and the false god it represents aren't real, there are real demonic powers at work behind them. Likewise, we might be tempted to say, well, the internet is only a tool. It can be good or bad, depending on how we use it. This is, of course, true. We can do good things with the internet and even use it to spread the Christian faith to great effect. However, that doesn't mean it's a neutral technology. Much of the time, our idolatrous hearts will lead us to use it for evil rather than good. That is how our relationship with it has developed. Like an idol, the internet does not merely represent the things our sinful heart desires. It promises to give us whatever we desire at our fingertips at any moment, whether that be entertainment, sex, friendship, fame, or money. 
The internet has become a temptation machine which is inexhaustibly efficient at addicting and, and enslaving the human heart. For most of us, this can be seen in the way we interact with our mobile devices, such as smartphones, which have become the portal through which we experience so much of our daily lives, from the most mundane activities like paying bills to the things that matter most to us, like our relationships with, with uh, family and friends. Because of this, it is very difficult to separate the activities that are gen genuinely beneficial and conducive to godly lives from those that would turn us away from those things and lead us into the temptation of various distractions. This isn't merely due to personal weakness on our part, but it's also part of the way these devices are designed and intended to be used. It's easy to feel helpless in the face of these technologies that are changing at an ever-increasing pace. Therefore, in response to this new conduit of temptation, let's follow the advice of St. Paul, who gives us a word of encouragement at the end of our reading. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you to be tempted beyond your ability but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. If we take Paul's advice as a whole then, in the face of this seemingly insurmountable temptation, we must not trust in our own knowledge and strength or in our maturity as Christians, but rather in God alone, who is faithful and will provide us the way of escape in temptation. As for what that way of escape is, it doesn't always mean that the temptation will simply disappear. Let us hear from Martin Luther's exposition of the Lord's Prayer, where he explains what we mean when we pray, lead us not into temptation. This, he writes, is what leading us not into temptation means. When God gives us power and strength to resist, even though the attack is not removed or ended. For no one can escape temptations or allurements as long as we live in the flesh and have the devil prowling around us. We cannot help but suffer attacks and even be mired in them. But we pray here that we may not fall into them and be drowned by them. At such times, our only help and comfort is to run here and seize hold of the Lord's Prayer and to speak to God from our heart. Dear Father, you have commanded me to pray. Let me not fall because of temptation. Then you will see that the temptation has to cease and eventually admit defeat. Otherwise, if you attempt to help yourself by your own thoughts and resources, you will only make the matter worse and give the devil a wider opening but prayer can resist and drive him back. With that in mind, dear friends, let us remember to pray continually to God that we may not fall into temptation. And let's recall the words of St. John, who ends his first epistle by saying, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.